The Demeter, uncharted, uncharted from, from Rainier to, to London. London. Shipping private, Shipping private crates, crates and contents unknown. Our charter, our charter has agreed to pay the bonus for timely or timely or timely or timely Something ripped in half the end. This looks like a bite. In the night, in the night, he bugs our blood. He is, he is. He's calling, calling Dracula, Dracula. 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 If you're not familiar with Bram Stoker's Dracula, check out my video on the novel and Francis Ford Coppola's 1992 adaptation starring Gary Oldman. Links in the description. You see, you can't destroy me. With that said, the novel is essentially considered the quintessential Dracula story, highlighting his voyage from Transylvania to London, his sensual seduction of maidens, his powers, his vicious attacks on the innocent, his attempt to expand his feeding grounds, and the great hunt by Van Helsing. Directed by Andre Overdell, who helmed The Troll Hunter and The Autopsy of Jane Doe, The Last Voyage of the Demeter takes a few pages from Stoker's magnum opus, tweaking and turning the events of that short chapter into a feature-length film. Given what happens in the novel, we can see where this is heading. The title itself gives you a not-so-subtle hint. Starring Corey Hawkins, Aileen Franciosi, the ever-commanding Liam Cunningham, and the chameleon David Dasmalchian, the film doesn't hold back on showcasing how merciless Dracula can be when he's hungry. Beginning at the end of the Dark Fated Voyage, the film opens with some exposition. We're told that in 1897, a Russian schooner had been chartered to carry private cargo, consisting of 50 wooden crates from Romania to England. On August 6, 1897, the Demeter was cruelly greeted by England's shores. While the vessel is found to be empty, its remnants bore silent witness to its tragedies, chief among them the captain's log. We then cut to the discovery of the ship, blown into the rocks by a violent storm. Upon investigation, the officers are horrified by the broken ghost ship covered in blood, which looked as though it had been torn apart from the inside, in addition to being damaged by the storm. As the men go over the log, they read a dire message from the captain, who says it is both a record and a warning of how they tried to stop a foul beast that defeated them. Ominously, it notes that God had abandoned them, before the film cuts to four weeks earlier in Bulgaria. Giving us a shot inside of a wooden crate carrying dirt and a mysterious walking cane, we zoom out to see dragon insignia and a long line of horse-drawn carriages making their way to Varma. As the Romanian gypsies arrive at port, we spot Captain Elliot walking down from the Demeter to greet them. We're told that they're a few hands short for the voyage, and his first mate Mr. Wojciech is in charge of recruiting sailors to lend them some help. At the same time, we're introduced to Clement, a doctor from Cambridge that has been struggling to find work in Europe. Overhearing the Demeter was bound for the long journey to London and was hiring new hands, we see him run off to join the others, hoping to find employment. Clemens piques their interest, especially when he noted he had supplies and understood astronomy, but Mr. Wojciech notes his soft hands and explains they needed someone that's engaged in manual labor, not a bookworm, before choosing three other strong men. Not one to give up, Clemens waits by the Demeter for another opportunity as the men began loading the cargo. Much to their surprise, the gypsies refuse to help them load the crates onto the boat, saying that they cannot stay and must leave before sunset. Calming his agitated people, their leader then approaches Captain Elliot's Romanian crewmate Olgarin and does something that confuses Mr. Wojciech. Without hesitation, the man hands him the money his people were paid to transport the crates to Varma, noting that this would compensate the Demeter's crew for the extra work they now had to do loading the crates. Ominously, he then wishes them good luck, saying that he hoped they saw the end of their journey before ordering his people to leave. And so, the crew begin loading the crates onto the ship and securing them into the cargo hold. But when one of the new hands that were hired spots the dragon symbol on the crate, he freaks out and lets go of the rope, nearly killing Captain Elliot's grandson Toby, who's saved by Clemens. Instead of being apologetic, the hand furiously curses them for not letting him know they were carrying a dark omen. Not at all concerned that he was forfeiting his newly acquired job, he then yells that may God save the ship and the crew before running away. 
With the captain thankful that Clemens risked his life to save Toby, Mr. Wojciech gives him the job instead, informing him that they'll be leaving in an hour, before warning that he'll throw him overboard if he was lying about being familiar with the boat. This is where the film shines. The mixture of CGI backgrounds with practical sets in the foreground bring the port of Varma and the Demeter to life. Ofridel effectively captures and drags the suspense from the setting, tone, and atmosphere, though I do wish he would have honored the source material more. As the crew, which also featured Abrams, Petrovsky, Larson, and Joseph get to work, Toby shows Clemens around the ship he'll be working on, accompanied by his dog Huck. The boy's essentially in charge of keeping the animals alive and healthy. Well beyond his years, he, like everyone else, takes deep pride in his role and place aboard the vessel. Guided through the cargo hold and over to the galley, he's introduced to the Demeter's chef, Joseph. The Puritan playfully tells him when they eat, that he should stay out of his kitchen, and not to use the Lord's name in vain, lest he forfeit his meal. Asking if he knew who Saint Nicholas was, Joseph is shocked to hear Clemens say that he was the patron saint of sailors, and acknowledges that he might not be a heathen after all. While the film is a recount of the captain's log in the novel, it should be noted that the one we hear narrated by Captain Elliot in the film isn't lifted directly word for word, and the director takes many liberties with a few details, changing things like the items they were transporting to London, to the addition of new crewmates in Bulgaria, plus two wholly new characters not present in the novel that effectively replace the importance of Captain Elliot. While most of the changes in the beginning and middle still embody the spirit of dread endured by the crew of the Demeter, who was slowly hunted down each night, towards the end, you realize how drastically this film is straying from Stoker's classic. With his crew joyfully dancing and enjoying themselves on the first night of their trek, Captain Elliot informs Mr. Wojciech that he'll be retiring after this journey. His plan is to buy a little cottage for Toby to enjoy the countryside and arrange for his first mate to become his successor when they reach land. Sad but honored, Wojciech dutifully agrees. Unfortunately for everyone, below the deck, Dracula emerges from one of the crates and surveys his new hunting ground. Startled by his supernatural presence and sensing what was about to happen, even the rats begin to leave, quite literally climbing off the boat and into the temporary shelter of the ocean. At the same time, the crew begin eating dinner, with Petrovsky being surprised to learn that minus the captain and first mate, everyone was receiving a generous 75 pounds each for the voyage. Abrams jokes that he'll be getting a nice haircut and new suit, something the ladies back home are gonna love. Joseph then smiles and tells him he'll be drowning in booze, while everyone else notes that Petrovsky will likely be spending all of his money at the brothel. Highlighting how their charter was paying them well for their timely arrival, Captain Elliot then asks Clemens what he planned to do with his share. Abrams makes fun of him, suggesting he might want a new petticoat, but Clemens remains steadfast, saying that everything he wanted in this world cannot be purchased, for what he wants is to understand the world. I mean, his medical degree costs money and has helped him gain a fundamental understanding of the world and how humans work, but that's just a nitpick. He says that the more he saw of the world, the less it made sense, and Elliot responds by telling him that the world cares little for sense, suggesting that perhaps it's not meant to be understood, but instead experienced and accepted. With Huck beginning to bark at something below, Toby and Clemens head down to investigate and find all the animals riled up. Assuming the wild weather was upsetting them, they begin putting covers over the cages as the doctor went into the cargo hold to investigate further. Finding one of the crates had fallen down, spilling its earthly contents onto the floor, Clemens reaches inside of the dirt and finds a pale woman that was barely clinging to life. While the frightened crew debate what to do with her, even positing that she was a bad omen and their rule was to throw stowaways overboard, Clemens tells them that she's infected. More than that, he demands that he be allowed to perform a blood transfusion to save her life, he even suggests allowing the pair to disembark at their next port. Of course, this frustrates Mr. Wojciech, who's annoyed that Clemens' loyalty wasn't with the captain. He also notes that by stopping at a port and losing time, they would all have to forfeit their bonus. Enabling him to at least try, Elliot explains he did not want his last voyage to be marred by the death of a young woman, whether she was a stowaway or not. Telling Clemens that she was now his responsibility, he orders them to repurpose the carpenter's deck into a new cabin, while her food and water rations would have to come out of the doctor's share. As the men stood and watched him work, Dracula emerges from his crate and is furious to discover his meal, the woman later revealed to be called Anna, had been taken away. Taking first watch with the doctor, Olgarin tries to impart some advice, urging him to be more considerate of the crew's thoughts and feelings. While Clemens was used to fighting for himself, as a member of the Demeter, he now needs to get used to working as a team. With the Doctor at the helm and the Demeter cutting through the Aegean Sea, the wise Romanian sailor looks out at the ocean and indicates that there are a lot of rocks nearby. To his horror, he spots Dracula through his telescope and begins to question his sanity when the creature then vanishes. 
Finding dirt and maggots where the monster had stood, Olgarin tells Clemens that there was something unnatural out there. Joseph and the rest of the crew are then horrified to discover a trail of death, with poor Huck and the livestock found massacred in a bloodbath. Something ripped apart the animals. All the livestock? This looks like a bite. Located with their necks torn open and all of their blood seemingly missing, the heinous act dumbfounds everyone. The men are quick to point the finger at Anna, but both Clemens and even Mr. Wojciech highlight that she was barely alive and could not have caused so much carnage. With that, the doctor theorizes that Huck might have gone rabid and killed the livestock, but literally everyone else is quick to defend the dog, saying that he was a very good boy. Going with the notion that the meat was now infected, Elliot orders him to throw the dead animals overboard. When he leaves, Petrovsky begins to stir the pot, angrily pointing the finger at Anna and Clemens. Cutting through their bitter resentment and anger, Olgarin tells him that this was not the deed of a man, but something evil that was now on board, hinting at the fables that he grew up with. Toby is also obviously broken, feeling as though he failed the captain, who charged him with taking care of the livestock. Reassuring him, Clemens explains that there are things in this world beyond their control, and that all they could do was their best. As they went by Cape Matapan, we learned that Anna was still passed out and receiving regular transfusions, and with a storm bearing down on the anxious crew, in addition to them still being two weeks away from their destination, the mood on the Demeter is uneasy to say the least. Speaking to Joseph, Clemens discovers that the rats were indeed gone. The doctor suggests that perhaps they made their way into the livestock and were also thrown overboard, but Joseph is adamant that this was a bad omen, saying that you could burn a ship down and still find rats nesting in the ashes. Telling him that something drove them off, he ominously notes that a boat without rats was against nature. Although Anna does come to and regains her strength, it's not long until the crew begin to fall, beginning with Petrovsky, who's lured to the foremast by damage to the cargo hold. Spotting a white emaciated humanoid crawling on the ground, the sailor gets his knife ready and is about to attack when Dracula lunges at his neck with his claws. Clearly drained of energy, the monster is reinvigorated by Petrovsky's blood and finishes the job by breaking his neck and drinking what was left. With Clemens finding his knife and ringing the alarm, the men begin speculating that he may have hurt himself and fallen overboard, explaining all the blood and his mysterious disappearance. Mr. Wojciech is initially suspicious of Clemens, but when the doctor notes he didn't have a drop of blood on him, and realizing it didn't seem characteristic for Clemens to commit murder, he, along with Elliot, join him in speculation. As Clemens noted the animals all had puncture marks on their neck, Anna awakens and screams that he was here and that they needed to get off the boat immediately. With Elliot beginning to hear reports from the others of strange sightings on the Demeter, he orders them to arm themselves, pair up and search the hull. However, while the men do this rather stoically despite their fear, not searching the cargo itself, they find nothing. It's here that Anna explained that she knew what was going on. She tells the doctor that a village spoke of an evil older than any human, which lived in a castle on the mountains. It effectively took the shape of man when it wanted to hide, and fed on the blood of humans at night for sustenance. Having lived in the shadow of the castle, she notes her elders had made bargains with the evil to prevent it from destroying all of them. To his surprise, this included offering Anna up as a sacrifice to Dracula, enabling him to feed on her during the voyage. Meanwhile, as the rain poured down, Olgarin discusses his mixed feelings to Larsen about having Anna on board, saying that while she was a bad omen, she also reminded him of his daughter. Unfortunately, when Larsen walks over to relight a lamp extinguished by a wave, Dracula claims him as the next victim, smashing his head on the deck right in front of Olgarin. When the Romanian sailor begs the vampire to leave him alone, Dracula then turns around with a devilish smile and repeats his words, highlighting that he took pleasure in their fear. It's not until the ship begins crashing into the waves, waking everyone up, that they realize Larsen was missing, before finding Olgarin injured and screaming in a frenzied panic, forcing them to tie him down. Examining his injuries, while Clemens refuses to believe Anna's story about a supernatural being, he concedes that there was something with them causing the mayhem. And so, wanting to put a stop to the madness, the captain orders him to do a comprehensive search of the Demeter during the day, encompassing every square inch of the ship. Responding to his master reawakening in the crates that night to feed, Olgarin, now a thrall of Dracula, breaks out of his restraints and chases the poor Toby. While the kid locks himself in the captain's quarters, with Olgarin using his body to break through the door, Toby is forced to hide, completely unaware that Dracula was actually in the room with him. Responding to the noise, the armed crew are able to restrain Olgarin before urging Toby to open the door. Staring through a hole, they're all horrified to see Dracula feed on him before they could break in. While they do recover Toby and get started on a blood transfusion, tying Olgarin to the mast, the others ponder at what could be wrong with him. 
To their shock, despite still being in a trance, he explains that he can hear everything, from the sea, the wind, to the blood pumping in their veins. Before he could clarify further, he informs them that it burns. They're just about to give him water when the sunrise hits his body and sets him alight, forcing Mr. Wojciech to put him out of his misery with a shot to the head. With the crew assembled below deck and the first mate trying to restore order, Joseph tells them that God was effectively punishing them all for their individual sins. When they all ignore him, he surprises them by betraying them later that night, saying prayers as he struck Abrams in the back of the head and took one of the lifeboats. Although managing to get some distance from the Demeter, he's horrified to learn that Dracula could fly as the beast swooped down and claimed him. And despite receiving blood transfusions from Elliot, with no pulse, they assume that Toby died and prepare his body for a sea burial. But when the captain sees his body moving, he unwraps it, only to have the possessed Toby attack him before burning in the sunlight. Reasoning that they cannot allow the beast to reach London, the remaining crew members decide to bring the Demeter down, causing the broken Captain Elliot to challenge them. Ultimately agreeing that saving the crew and defeating the monster was more important than his ship, Elliot acquiesces, choosing to finish his log and ensure that people knew he was true to his trust. Although they arm themselves and begin sabotaging their vessel, Unperturbed by their plan, Dracula continues to feed, claiming Abrams, Wojciech, and Captain Elliot. Eventually crushing Dracula with the mast, Clemens and Anna jumped ship, believing they defeated him. But of course, as they drifted away in their raft and the Demeter crash on the rocks, we see the vampire free himself and fly away to safety. As the sun began to rise, it's here that Anna reveals the blood transfusions were merely a temporary stopgap for the inevitable, with her body then burning up upon contact with the light. Although people in Whitby assumed that everyone of the Demeter had died, as informed by Elliot's log, the final scene features Clements vowing to find and defeat Dracula. Now having gained his full strength, we see the master vampire in human form, beckoning his food to follow him. I really love this alien-style story set on the ocean in 1897. It was just, just all, all the, the elements, elements were really, really exciting. exciting. The last voyage of the Demeter pretty much winks at you from the get-go, and Overdale might be reeling us into a well-trodden tale, but he's got a few tricks up his sleeve. It's less about the destination and more about the journey. The Demeter sells through a grim, gothic atmosphere with a crew of actors who seem to understand their mission and dive headfirst into the madness. I wanted this to be the scariest depiction of Dracula ever. There's something potent about that mythology. Everyone knows fear, and I think Dracula represents that. Having gone through the horrors of confined spaces and the autopsy of Jane Doe, it's no shocker Overdale knows how to trap an audience in one location and marinate them with dread. Every groan and creak of the Demeter, an entity of its own, makes you feel like you're on board, sensing the mounting terror. But the main course is Botet's Dracula, who's more like a lurking predator, a la Ridley Scott's Xenomorph, than your traditional suave vampire. Taking cues from classics like Nosferatu and Salem's Lot, this Dracula's an intriguing blend of old and new. He's captivating, menacing, playful, and always terrifyingly brutal. And he's so the way he moves, the way he turns his neck, the detail, detail, detail in this movie is so key. But the movie, with its DNA rooted in Ridley Scott's alien, sometimes teeters like a drunken sailor, struggling to maintain its course with weak character motivations, slow pacing, and a complete disregard for key elements in the novel. I really wanted to like The Last Voyage of the Demeter. It does well to capture the terror, confusion and plight of the crew, the scale of the ship, the indomitable supernatural force that is Dracula, but it makes some baffling changes. For starters, the captain is supposed to be the main character, as we get an account of what happened through his log. He's the last man standing, witnessing the death and disappearances of all of his men until finally stumbling upon Dracula. Tying himself to the helm with a cross in one hand and his log in the other, even though he knew he was about to die, he wanted people to be warned of the impending danger. His log and the experiences of others end up informing Van Helsing and co on how best to defeat Dracula, but the movie undercuts the captain's importance in favor of Clemens and Anna and chooses to omit key sequences that would have bridged this movie to Stoker's Dracula. Instead of setting up the appearance of Van Helsing, Jonathan, Mina, Quincy, Arthur and Jack, who ultimately hunt Dracula down at the end of Stoker's novel and introducing the religious elements surrounding Dracula, like his weaknesses to crosses, we get a weird alternate reality where Clemens not only survived the Demeter, but is now also hunting him down. This was also done in a very contrived way, given the numerous opportunities the vampire has to kill him in the final act. With that said, the film does at least attempt to flesh out the sailors featured in the chapter, who we only get second-hand accounts about from the captain. David Dismalchian brings his intense energy and charm to Wojciech, a first mate burying his fear and confusion to ensure their ship ran smoothly. 
Liam Cunningham is a tour de force as the veteran commander of the Demeter. Thoughtful, considerate, and yet still uncompromising. His word is law, and you definitely feel that the men trust him with their life. Chris Wally and Nikolai Nikolov are decent as Abrams and Petrovsky. They don't really have that much to play with in the script, but you still get a rough idea of who they are and what they're after. Stefan Kapovich is also pretty solid as the Romanian sailor Olgarin, and the first with a clear understanding of the evil that was tormenting them. Despite being terrified as the first person to see Dracula, he's a good person that tempers that fear, giving Clement some balanced advice on how to gel better with the rest of the crew. There is fantastic jump scares, fantastic acting. We get actors to do proper scenes. It would do it a disservice to call this a horror movie. John John Briones was also another standout, playing the chef with the kind of religious zealotry that would make a nun blush. Quick to call others out on blasphemy in front of him, the hypocrite betrays the group like an aquatic Judas. Ailing Francioski was also surprisingly compelling for a new character inserted into the mix. Her Anna is an enigma, stubborn, superstitious, but willing to help the crew, despite knowing her own fate. We see her gain some agency, transforming from a slave meal of the beast to his hunter. The death of Woody Norman's Toby is a heartbreaking spectacle, reinforcing the merciless and callous nature of Dracula, while Corey Hawkins does okay as a man of celestial maps and medicine and a sea of superstition. Although the rest dream of cashing in, Clemens is out there chasing the intangible, a thirst for knowledge. Through him, the movie sells straight into murky philosophical waters. Mr. I think therefore I am is trying to use science to poke holes in age-old superstition, surrounded by seasoned sailors who trust their guts more than a textbook. His attempt at understanding the mysteries of the world ultimately stops at, maybe you ought to live a bit first. Overdale's slow burn approach does build tension, but there are moments where I'm just begging for the plot to chug along a tad faster. Ultimately, the film is a mixed bag that prioritizes tone and atmosphere over character and substance, and the ending, which completely disregards the source material, felt like they were fishing for a sequel nobody wants before the credits even rolled. Unfortunately for Universal, The Last Voyage of the Demeter has taken a dive into the cinematic abyss, pulling in a pitiful 6.5 million in its opening weekend off its $45 million budget, effectively halting any plans for a follow-up film. Satan's black blood pumping corruption through his veins. God's anger has come upon this vessel like Jonah. Shut up! With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we cover The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and check out the Film Comics Explained podcast on the second channel. And if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Evil is on board. Powerful evil. <laughs>